Hey guys, welcome to the next little bit in the episode about the Galliano junk pile. An arch top has a beautiful headstock, but the rest of it's tore up from the floor up. And if you notice, I have my Bullet Boys shirt on. Yeah, the one with the splitting mall issue here. And uh, while we're at that, Shout out to the Bullet Boys. Don't tell me that you didn't listen to the Bullet Boys or Cinderella or any of them real hair bands. Yeah, <laughs> Cinderella has some of the best slide guitar you can listen to uh, between laying between two LTEC speakers the size of a, a deep freeze. Hello. We've been there, right? Speaking of Bullet Boys, yeah. Hey, Jimmy D. Yeah, Jimmy D broke this. Anyway. Shout out to Jimmy DeAnda. So, by the way, they're still around. They run around, and uh, I think Jimmy DeAnda's playing for George Lynch, who come out of Doc, and yeah, I, I'm one of those. You, you could have figured I was. Anyway, what are we talking about? Oh, yeah, the splitting mall accident. We took the neck off of the guitar, steamed the neck off. Is that not an awesome headstock? Anyway, I got a playlist going on. Uh, link right about there, right about now. Start off with an introduction to this, where I got it from, what was wrong with it. Then we went into pulling the steaming the neck off. It's still all swelled up from all the steam. But anyway, now what we're going to be doing is this thing has some terrible, terrible splits all over, running top to bottom, front and back. Sides are okay, but look, when you're dealing with arch tops, there's a couple things you need to remember. First, they're arched. Imagine that. Now, I've got a couple of paper bowls here that I have cut and used a magic marker or sharp or whatever you want and we're going to talk about loading on a dome and, and what difference it makes and what that means when you when you um, are gluing this stuff back together because if you don't if you got a split that's running top to bottom or is nearly top to bottom and you fix one side of this versus the middle or the opposite, it will have a big, big effect structurally. Now, I want to tell you that we pretty much know that the best arch tops, they would take, I got all kinds of stuff going on over here. They would take pieces of spruce that were matched and bookend them draw it out and then they were very thick not like this by the way this is from Anirondack tone woods this is spruce I cut actually cleats out of this stuff to fix cracks with and you'll see that and I'm gonna shave it down and make it a little bit thinner and I, I may actually soak it a little bit or steam it to get it to match the curvature because guess what if something is arched and you put something straight on it what's it gonna do well, it's going to straighten out the arch, which is undesirable, which is going to make the split either suck in, spread, or go out. Wood is very predictable once you figure it out, and I do trees for a living. Anyway, so you bookend it like this, and then people would actually take tools. Look at this one. This is a box label scraper. So they would take fruit boxes and take this thing, and flip it over and you would actually just run this up and take the paper off. But these things, if you can get one and take it apart, this right here makes a great hand scraper for doming out an arch top body. And then ultimately they would take just a scraper and scrape and scrape. So when you glued this together, like so, and drew everything out. Again, it would be a lot thicker. It would typically taper down from the middle to the edge. You would basically shave this part where the edge was thin, 
which gave you missing wood here, leave this built up, and then once that was done, you would turn it over and scoop out the middle part so the body went like this and was hollow on the inside. The idea was that the thinner the wood was and the more domed it was, the more resonant the guitar was, uh, meaning when you hit uh, the soundboard, which is the top of the guitar, where the strings and bridge are, the more it would vibrate, the thinner it is. Um, Ken Parker did a bunch of stuff, and his arch tops, I think, start at 50 grand, but he's got a, a clip that I've shared with you before. It's long, but it talks about uh, the development, origin development of the arch top guitar, and he gets into all kinds of acoustic properties and um, how things vary with the thickness of things and all that kind of thing. But we all know that these guitars I deal with were coming out of the Sears catalog and the Montgomery Wards catalog. And this one, this Galliano was made in uh, 19, somewhere between 1940 and 1942 by Harmony. So Harmony was a jobber. They would make their own guitars. They would make, uh, Kay would make their own guitars and brand them as such, but they were making guitars for other people. And this one was actually uh, targeting the um, Italian population and immigrants in the northeastern United States, believe that or not. So anyway, we're going to talk when we set this down on the bench about fixing these cracks. Now, the good thing about this guitar being so tore up is I am going to take the back of this off. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of things you need to pay attention to because once wood that's used to being together with other parts of wood gets out on its own and it's winter, it's summer, the humidity's up, it's down. It's going to start doing its own thing and if you wait too long and you try to put it back together you're going to have more problems and then when you try to buckle it back down to what you want it to do it's going to fight you and all the cracks and cleats and everything else you had going on are going to fight you and then you're going to end up with even more of a mess and worse yet, if the arch top curvature collapses, you've got a mess and then you end up putting cleats on it and metal parts and marble mystery oil cans like the Bonneville junk pile. Not that that's bad, but yeah, a little bit more about how they made these things. A few of the better models that were not Gibsons, definitely. Um, you actually had craftsmen scraping them and, and doing things like that, but that was few and far between. The solid body stuff, most of the time, it was they would get the piece of wood, they would steam it, and then they would take a, 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 a stamp where it just boom. So you've got this body. I don't know. I've worked in an iron foundry, so if you know anything about how um, sand is used to make molds for uh, metal parts. There's a, a, a part here, a part here, and then you put something in the middle that gives an indentation for up here and down here, and you pour metal in it. Well, this was kind of the same thing. You would have a stamp, and you would take this piece of wood that was big enough to be a guitar body, and you would just basically put it in there, and this thing would come down, and it would steam the, the, the arch top, and that's the way most of these were made. Another thing you need to think about is um, if you see a guitar that has a uh, V-neck, a pronounced V-neck, this one has one somewhat. The um, Archcraft guitar I've worked on, I'm burning up cards here fast, it had a pronounced V-neck, so it was made in the earlier 30s. But you'll see that some of these guitars, the tops of them were plywood, and the other ones were a piece of solid birch or, or in some cases, if you're lucky, spruce. So if you look at an old guitar and you see it splitting and you look at one that's kind of the same era and it's not splitting, you want to take a look at the side of the F hole and ask yourself, is it solid wood or is it plywood? So which one splits easier? Well, let's talk about this. The grain on this spruce is very clear. It runs straight up and down. So if I get a split here, it's going to follow the grain. Now, if I 
torsionally bend this where things are twisting and body twisting and waist is drying out and that kind of stuff. I may get a crack here and then one running off to the side of it. That's a torsional split. Solid wood, one piece of wood is more likely to do that. But if I take a piece of wood and lay it this way and another one and the grains are running different, that is going to be less likely to split. So sometimes a split is actually indicative of a better quality guitar. That come out of me and no one else. And so as usual, I'm going to try to use some simple things to uh, talk about loading and where things isolate and where cracks come from and all that kind of thing. And I'm going to use a couple simple paper bowls that I've cut a line in representing cracks. And this is kind of the theory of an arch top. It's not that pronounced. We've got a flat edge here. It's something that actually dips down a little bit. The reason it dips down a little bit instead of coming straight up, that actually gives you more area in the wood to dome up and more to scoop out on the inside. But gluing an edge crack versus a center crack first, whichever one you do, right, is going <laughs> to make a difference. And it might actually exacerbate your problem that you're trying to fix and create new problems. So without exacerbating my lecture and making it going on meaningless with theory only I understand, um, let's just get to the bench. We're going to have to take the back of this guitar off. There's a tone bar that I am actually holding that used to be inside. Uh, we've got all kinds of stuff to do, and it's all... Uh, we need to think about what we're doing front, back, and with the bars and everything, and also what, how we're going to add um, stuff to hot rod it up. So let's hit the bench. Stick with me. You are going to learn from my mistakes. Okay, guys, we are finally at the bench. Let's take a look here at, uh, before I pull the back off, ultimately what we are going to be concerned with. There are running cracks from here. This one goes up to here and stops, but then it seems to want to pick up here and go to the edge. We have one that's starting at the edge here. We have one at the edge here, one running alongside of it. And then this is the worst one here. It goes all the way from the edge up to here. Now, fortunately, these cracks are running this way and not we don't have anything this way running perpendicular to the grain the answer to running these running cracks is to glue in some cleat material and arrange the grain of the cleat material to be perpendicular to the crack thus stopping it but before we get to do all of that it's going to be easier to take the back of this off and then with the back off, we can deal with the tone bar that came out in these numerous cracks here once we have access. Again, we pulled the neck off first so we could have the benefit of the body structure to put the um, neck pulling jig on. Let's set this aside for a minute and get some more of that theory that I'm talking about out of the way. Um, I have these two paper cups here, or kind of. Okay, never mind, forget that. I'll get your money another way. Um, let's do this. This represents an arch top, okay? Back or front doesn't matter. This part here is lower. It comes up, it flattens out, or has a dome. Kind of like an arch top is carved. Um, this is an exaggerated view of it, but a piece of wood about that thick turns into something that's shaped like this. And the most important part is if this comes up out here, then on the inside it's curved like this. So what happens with these cracks is once they start, I want you to watch here when I push down. Let's get this one out of the way and let's get a pointer. If I push down here, I want you to watch right here. You see there's a crack or a, uh, I'm going to call this a deformation. 
a deformation. Don't confuse that with defamation, which is kind of like somebody that stands at a podium during a public meeting and slanders and berates a, a I don't know, say a public official or public employee uh, and does it thinking that they have privilege to do that as a taxpayer and no one can do anything about it until the point where it becomes defamation and then incessantly and with motive becomes malicious <laughs> misrepresentation. Come on, guys, any paralegal would know that. Back to guitars and crane booms. Crane booms, you're asking, where did crane booms come into this? Well, let's say I have a crane. Let's say this is a crane. Did you ever notice that on television, every crane is a giant crane, right? And so I have something dangling off of this. You can see this is moving back and forth like this. And I have something, and it's very heavy. And I'm swinging along, and I'm not paying attention. And all of a sudden, my boom hits this building. That point right there becomes a point of load isolation. When that happens, you have elastic failure in which elastic failure is the inability of the object that's being bent to return back to its configuration. You're getting down to the molecular level in iron and wood when that happens, but elastic failure happens because things are permanently deformed. So this type of deformation is what causes these cracks to run. Now, look at this one. I didn't cut a groove in this one, but instead I cut the grooves out here. When I push down or put pressure or pull up this way, do you see what happens? If the, if the arch top has shrunk down and cracking it involves pulling it back up, in one case, pushing it down causes gap here, and here it causes it to come back together. So what we have to be concerned with is there are multiple planes that need to line up this way, this way and this way to put these things back together. So at the end of the day, we've got to make sure that this doesn't come over each other, that this doesn't spread apart, and this doesn't warp. And on top of that, this guitar has gotten used to part of itself being detached from the other parts of itself. And you can see that on this side already, there's some overhang here and things aren't going to be like being pushed back together on multiple planes. So, the first thing we need to do is take our tape dispenser here. I've shown you this one before. It's awesome. Can't beat this. This is binding tape in two different tackiness levels of tacky, even beyond me. But we're going to take couple pieces of this tape here and put them on parts of the guitar that are still attached and relatively flat and we're going to make a couple marks as to where this stuff is going to line up when it comes time that the cracks on the back are fixed and everything else is Rather be glued back up. And wouldn't you know, I put a piece of tape right where there's a crack to be fixed. Anyway, you get the idea. Let me get this thing marked up. And then we'll go over the tools we're going to need to get the back off. Okay, you can see we have a number of points marked to line up. Uh, on the back side of the guitar and also on the corresponding sides. And I've marked it right and left so I don't put the thing back inside out. We have a couple of tools going on here. We have Grandma's iron and of course, let's handle dangerous stuff when it's hot. Yes, the hobo hot plate up here on the side shelf of the Stumac workstation. We'll put the palette knives underneath 
the iron and warm those up. Now the most important thing to remember is one of these knives is totally different. Yeah, you heat this one up and you start going inside this guitar, you're actually going to come into that depth. And we all know that there's kerfing under here, which is this kind of stuff. I just happen to have a piece of it right here. It sits inside the guitar against the sides. It bends and it glues the top and bottom or the soundboard, which is the top of the guitar and the back. Wow, I actually put something away. It glues it to sides and the top and back together. And you saw how wide it is. So if I start going and fishing around in here like this with a hot knife, anything that comes in the way of this is going to be loosened up. And we have things in here loosened up already. Now I'm going to re-glue everything, of course. But I have taken one of these bigger pallet knives and cut it down purposely so this goes in and only reaches in as far as the kerfing is likely to be and that way I'm not cutting anything loose unintentionally so we're going to warm this stuff up under the iron and start working the back loose okay now this is paint on binding here which means no binding and sometimes you can walk along with a razor knife and be real careful and start to score that line because it's real easy when you start heating this up and things are cracked already where you might put the pallet knife in and end up cutting there like this. So kind of take one of these little surgical knives or razors and go along and trace that out before you start. If you're doing this on a fine guitar, you're going to want to tape up everything and use the right tackiness and all that so you don't strip the finish off. But then it's just a matter of taking your little knife here. It's nice and hot, so don't forget that. And dropping it down where you scored that. And just be real slow. You'll feel the glue start to melt away. Hide glue. I don't think they used hide glue because they thought about us 80 years later taking this apart. I think it was cheap and plentiful and it's what they used at the time. I'm going to talk about the tailpiece on this guitar in a little bit because this guitar was made during the war effort where they were trying to save materials. So it actually had a wooden tailpiece, trapeze, believe it or not. Now once I get this in here, I can use a knife that's not hot and kind of pull this back and help me. But don't get in a rush doing this because you'll only crack it worse. Now as we go along here, you're going to see there's a little piece right there that had tried to split out. You see right there? See it right there? You want to make sure that that gets preserved along the way and it doesn't fall out. But this hot knife now is starting to want to work. If you have a couple pieces of cigar box liner sitting around, you can taper them off on a belt sander like this and use this to open this crack up just a little bit. Don't get too far gone because when you start prying that open, this part down here where it's held together still, it'll want to develop a run and split right there, again due to load isolation. So. This is a long, tedious process, but any time that you spend being careful now is going to reward you later. Okay, we're getting up here near the top of the soundboard where all the curves are and stuff. And people will tell you, oh, you can use a heat gun like this. And you sure can. The only thing about it is this is the quickest way to ruin a finish on a decent guitar. So... Anyway, it's kind of therapeutic. I run 100 miles an hour all day, and this is one of them things where I can just go along, score a little bit, and take my little pallet knife that just gets to the kerfing and just go along and open this up. 
and work with it very careful. It's going along fast now. But again, I'm getting near where there's some cracks right here. Notice I've taped off all the long cracks. So getting up in here is where I'm going to want to be really, really careful right now and just take my time. Again, these cleats that I have cut out of the inside of a cigar box and tapered off uh, the ends of work out really well to get me a little gap here that I need without making it too bad that's going to bust anything else up. So it's pretty much loose except from here to here and I'll catch up with you then. Okay, you can tell that this back has been glued on before because there's a little offset right there. You see it, it this is not a hot knife so don't worry about it. Like you care about my well-being anyway, but yeah, there's an overhang of about that much. So this back has been glued on before, but once you get rolling here and you got your spacer and your knife is hot, you're just kind of coming in here and you're just walking forward like that. Can you see that? You're just walking forward and scooting your knife and the hot knife will walk down. And when it starts cracking a little bit, warm up the knife again. Move your spacer down a little bit like this. Again, real easy to make. And be patient. I keep telling you that, so just be patient. All right, this is the cool part. We are going to have a look at 80 years of history right now as we pull the back off. Okay. 460H960. That's a harmony number. Um, there is a bit of scraping and stuff to do here because there is a bit of binding left. But the reason these cracks aren't coming together very well is a past repair made when somebody pulled up one side or the other. That's why that there was that offset there, but there's still paint slopped in here. Here's the cloth tape that was put on to stop everything from splitting in the beginning in the factory. Um, but yeah, let's look at the inside. You can see that there's corresponding with what's going on there. Wow, 460H960 right there. Um, I don't see a date. Usually there was a, a square or something like that. I don't see a signature. Sometimes the workers will write something on the inside with a pencil. I don't see any of that. I do see that right up here, there was a piece of little one piece of replacement kerfing put in. I see that that's hide glue. You can tell hide glue. I'm sure glad they use hide glue. Now there's been repairs to this before. You can see there was a repair here, a repair here, and a repair here. And then you have to pay close attention because this tone bar, I don't know if you've ever seen a tone bar, this is rounded off on top, but they had to be shaped to the bottom of the guitar or, or the soundboard, the top, and you can see that this is this was carved to the arch, so it sits this way. How do we know it sits this way and not this way? There's a little piece of that cloth tape right there, which means it sat right like that. Um, the kerfing is in pretty good shape. Might be a little bit of leveling to do here with something or other. We'll take care of that. I'm going to make sure that all of this gets hide glue injected back into it. I don't want this to come apart, but this is so cool. This is one of the coolest parts of doing this. You got to see something that somebody saw in the Harmony factory somewhere between 1940 and 1942. Awesome.
All right, guys, I don't know about you, but this is quite the experience for me because we get to go back and see what somebody hasn't seen in 80 years before they glued the back on. So we put some tape on here. We do the thing we do to the other 100 or 200 guitars we worked on that day 80 years ago. But um, the next episode is going to be about going in and fixing these cracks, putting cleats on. We're going to take... Uh, um, some hide glue and put it in uh, a syringe and go around and make sure that everything is glued up and sealed up and nothing's loose and moving around. We're going to make sure that we get all these edges done and everything like that. Um, and then we'll move on to putting the neck back on. While we got it open, we're going to take a look at where we want to put the electronics and stuff and make sure everything is good there. And I might even be able to put the harness in while we have the back off so anyway stick with me on this one uh i appreciate your comments and i will see you next time when we get the hide glue out